Well, welcome everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar on identifying and treating agoraphobia. I think panic disorder might be better for the, the team on the webinar here. But anyway, it is agoraphobia and uh, we welcome all of the viewers who are watching the recording as well later on. MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So I'm Steve Trumbull and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by clinical background and I've been involved in health professional education for many years. The other panellist bios were disseminated with the webinar invitation, so in the interest of ensuring we cover as much content as possible during the webinar, we'll skip going over the bios in detail. But we are joined tonight by Caroline Johnson. Hello, Caroline. Hi, Steve. Now, Caroline, as a fellow GP educator, what's one thing you think it is important for other mental health professionals to know about the GP's role in improving outcomes for people who are experiencing agoraphobia? Well, the one thing I would emphasise is continuity of care. So the advantage that we have in general practice of seeing people over time and really helping them stay engaged in treatment um, and making sure that people get the kind of right dose and duration of therapy they need to recover from a condition like agoraphobia. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Can only fully agree as a, as a GP, continuity is what it's all about. Uh, Peter McAvoy, welcome. Now, you've been working with the Centre for Clinical Interventions in Western Australia for a number of years. Can you share a bit more about the work you do with this organisation? Thanks, Steve. Uh, really wonderful to be with you. Uh, the Centre for Clinical Interventions specialises in the treatment of anxiety disorders, affective disorders, so unipolar depression, bipolar disorder, and eating disorders. Uh, so we offer cognitive behaviour therapy, um, and we've been going for over 20 years now. Uh, so I've been working there all, the, all of that time, except for four years at CRUFAD uh, in Sydney uh, in the uh, early to mid 2000s. Great. Thank you. And I'm sure that's where you worked most closely with Lisa Lamp. Now, Lisa, we need to build a shrine to you. You have struggled enormously tonight with getting online, but you're here and we're very glad to have you here appropriately. You've been working with anxiety and OCD disorders for many years. What is it that's kept you engaged in that very challenging area of practice? Look, it's the fact that people get better, um, that we have treatments that work. I love the collaborative nature of working with people and the fact that um, I learn from my patients and I can then pass that on to future patients and it's a uh, wonderful circle of people getting better and, and all of us learning more. Right. Yeah, there's absolutely no question that feeling that you're achieving something is what keeps us going, doesn't it? So that's wonderful that that motivates you. So we've got a great panel tonight, lots to talk about. We are using a new web player tonight, so I will just ask you to pay attention, even if you've heard this bit before. But to interact with the webinar platform and to access the resources, there are a few options you can um, see there on the screen. To click the uh, supporting resources button, you, you click that view supporting resources button under the video panel there. If you want to access the slides, the resources, uh, the survey at the end, and also to get technical support should you, should you need it. Um, you can access the chat, which is at the top right. Uh, you can see a speech bubble up there, and that's where you can click on that to get onto the chat room. Um, as I've mentioned, if you need technical support, you can click the dark button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We often find the webinar, or if, if the webinar stops for people, it's usually an NBN issue rather than anything else. So please try refreshing your browser. And if there's anything you have missed, this webcast is being recorded. Within the chat room, please make sure that you are respectful of other participants and panellists uh, and also keep comments on topic in the chat box. I can see there's lots going on in the chat box about people not being able to hear. Uh, you have to turn your volume up manually to be able to hear, so please make sure <coughs> you've done that. And if your screen's frozen, sorry, uh, please um, reload and you should be able to get back onto us. And Crystal's frozen as well. Crystal Lockhart, you can't hear me, but if everybody knows Crystal, send her a text. Re reload the, the, the URL. Now, enough of that. 
Tonight, each panellist will give a short discipline specific presentation, uh, which will relate to the case which has been circulated. Um, and then after that, we'll have questions and answers between the panel. The aim and the learning outcomes are displayed. Uh, I won't read through them because you can do that yourself. Um, but um, basically, it is all about uh, learning about the comorbidities and most importantly, I think for tonight, identifying treatments that work. So we'll move in now to the interdisciplinary presentations. And we're starting off with poor old Stella. Um, and I must say it's probably one of the more florid case studies we've had in this series of webinars, but I always wanted to be a Mills and Byrne novelist. So there we go. But anyway, plenty to talk about. Let's start with Caroline. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you for um, having me here tonight. So I'm going to share the GP perspective, and I think the first thing that we have to talk about for GPs is, you know, we're the first point of call with respect to the health system. So it's very unlikely that Stella will walk in the door and just want help right away. In fact, we know from the 2007 National Mental Health Survey that only one third of people who, you know, could benefit from help were actually accessing help. But the most important thing it found is of the two thirds of people who weren't accessing help, 85% of them said they had no need for help. So that's the world of the GP. People come to the GP about something or, you know, somebody else says to the GP they're worried about someone. So it's a very different problem than when someone's already engaged in seeking help. So the questions I have are, you know, what's what Stella's developmental perspective? You know, is she, is she going to come in with her mum dragging her in or, or a friend's going to bring her in or is she going to present on her own? Um, how willing is she, given that she's anxious and, 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 and struggling and staying at home, will she actually get help? And then there's all the other questions around what, what can happen to engage someone in care. And obviously when people are anxious, you know, it's very hard to kind of reassure them that even though, you know, there's a lot of barriers to accessing care, there's costs, there's appointment availability and everything else, it's worth accessing care. So the GP's role is often trying to make those barriers minimal. And then also to kind of... Um, think about having conversations with people about what's the right kind of therapy for that specific problem. And that's something that can be quite hard to do when there's time limitations, but I think it's really important. And I often tell my GP colleagues to focus on what's the tipping point for the patient. So often, you know, the point will be that their friends say this isn't good enough or, you know, they've, their, their employment's at risk. Moving on to assessment, um, I guess the big thing to, hear, to, to recognise here is the, the, the next slide, please. The GP role is um, not so much about getting the diagnosis perfect. It's about making sure that you're not missing anything. So certainly in a very brief way, making sure that you're not missing any physical health problems. And GPs have little approaches to that. You know, what's the most likely diagnosis? What are the red flag diagnoses I want to, I want to miss? And Lisa will touch on a bit of a few of those things we consider. And then this consideration of, well, does it matter what kind of anxiety Stella has? Um, and I, I think it does matter because different types of anxiety respond to different types of, of, of therapy, but also there's more than just getting the diagnosis right. There's the formulation and thinking about, you know, what are the factors that, and again, people talk a bit more about formulation, but recognising that the GP formulation is often not done in a nice linear way from presentation to end. It's often bits of information that occur over time. Moving on to the next point, which is the management slide. Um, I guess the big thing to emphasise here is the GP's really work in what I call a dimensional perspective. We don't really wait for someone to cross a categorical diagnostic line before we do stuff, although a lot of the systems we work in actually require us to. So, for example, you're only eligible for a mental health treatment plan if you've got a diagnosis, but most of us in general practice land will be a bit pragmatic about that and say to patients, well, you know, if you're very close to crossing this line, we won't wait until you get sicker. Um, but there are implications for that around the person, you know, having a diagnosis. And in that respect, it's really important to listen to the patient. What do they think is going on? Even if you disagree with what they think is going on, you've got to have a conversation about, you know, what do you think caused the problem and spend a lot of time on having conversations about, you know, what the mental health professional's view is of what causes anxiety and what perpetuates it. Because getting that kind of shared understanding can really help prepare someone for therapy. And then there's, of course, the conversation around what type of therapy and I'm not going to speak about that a lot now, except to say the GP has a really important role in explaining to people with anxiety disorders that getting help is hard. You know, I often use analogies like, you know, 
you don't expect someone to suddenly run a marathon if they're not training for it. And to get help for anxiety, you really have to be, you know, prepared to commit to a bit of um, a bit of time and work. And, and my role as the GP is to sit with you on that journey. So moving on to um, how will we then work once we hand over the care to other professionals? And I guess the big thing here is GPs do like to know from the health professionals we're referring to what their approach will be. I certainly spend a lot of time when I meet someone who says, I had therapy before it didn't help. I say, well, what exactly happened in therapy? Because then I can at least form a view of, did they get an evidence-based therapy? Did they get CBT or something else? Um, and so for those of you who often interact with GPs, please remember it's not that helpful to just say to Stella, go and see a GP to get a plan. If, they, if someone turns up with a 15-minute appointment, you're not going to get a very good quality plan with that approach. So thinking about how you're going to engage, not just with the GP, but also with the patient and the family. And then the last points I guess I want to make, which is my big area of interest, which is the last slide I'm going to talk to, is the issue about recovery. And I think, you know, it is true what Lisa says, treatment for agoraphobia does work, but people often have a lot of false starts because it's a difficult thing to do. And I see myself, my, you know, the GP role, my, my own role very much is to say to the person, I'm sticking with you on this journey. I want you to come back. If, if it's not working or you want to drop out of therapy, that's your choice, but come and talk to me about it because this will come and go and you might have a few false starts. And I do think that that ability to monitor someone over time and look out for relapse and talk about relapse signals and finding out, you know, what did you do when treatment didn't help um, is really important in keeping people engaged for the longer term. So I think they're the main points from me, Steve. That's great. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks very much indeed. And so you would have probably given a diagnosis, I guess, to Stella in this case, and um, she'd move on um, if you weren't going to do the counselling yourself to a clinical psychologist or other suitable counsellor. And um, Pete McAvoy is going to give us that perspective now. Thanks, Pete. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I feel like on behalf of all psychologists, I need to thank Caroline and all the GPs for all the amazing work they do before we see clients in, in uh, helping to collaborate with the explanatory models and preparing them for therapy, which makes our job a lot easier. Um, so when we first start to see a client, obviously we'll uh, put together a problem list and really trying to understand the impacts on the, on the client's life from, from their problems. So in Stella's case, if there's a history of panic uh, attacks, then understanding uh, their onset, any changes, persistence, frequency and intensity of those attacks, um, and we'll, I'll probably ask Stella to give me a, a really detailed example of a time when she's experienced uh, a panic attack or in terms of agoraphobia, uh, just how she experiences that. Um, I want to be pretty sure that a medical uh, review has been completed uh, and I'm assuming uh, after um, someone has seen uh, Caroline that uh, that has been completed and I can assume that uh, there are no medical complications uh, and so a psychological formulation of, of the problems is appropriate. Um, I do want to assess the co-occurring problems, so depression, social anxiety, and also the temporal relationship between those problems. So did the agoraphobia follow the social anxiety or, or come before, uh, and the depression as well, because that tells us something about the relationship between the problems that, that uh, Stella's presenting with, and also guides what might be the treatment priority. Um, some of the low-hanging fruit uh, may be lifestyle factors um, that we might want to consider working on as well, uh, but also protective factors uh, that we may want to recruit to support um, Stella's recovery as we work through therapy. Um, we want to be aware of other uh, interventions, uh, particularly medications. If there are uh, uh, PRM medications like benzodiazepines, then that might really interfere with our progress. So we really need to know about that at the outset. And then we want to assess change. Uh, so as part of our uh, assessment formulation, we might administer some psychometric measures with some of the beliefs, uh, some of these scales as examples here, uh, that we also want to target in treatment and see change in over the course of therapy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we will do a, a, an assessment of predisposing factors. We know that anxiety is highly heritable, uh, so it tends to run in families. Uh, so there's a, a kind of a genetic component most often, uh, also some um, environmental uh, factors, so parenting or modelling of coping behaviours with anxiety that you might want to know about, and also significant life events, so any early experiences of trauma, separation, deaths of parents, for example. And then temperamental factors, so uh, non-specific uh, temperamental factor. When I say non-specific, I mean 
uh, increases risk to a whole range of different uh, mental disorders, things like neuroticism. But in terms of uh, panic disorder and agoraphobia, anxiety sensitivity, a fear of those physical sensations, which may be uh, a fear that physical, physical sensations may lead to a medical catastrophe or a, a cognitive catastrophe in terms of losing one's mind or um, social catastrophe. So uh, may lead to severe negative evaluation, for example. People who believe their anxiety may lead to those things uh, are more likely to develop panic disorder and potentially agoraphobia. We can't change a lot of those predisposing factors that have happened well in the past, but we can work on what's left behind. So uh, some of the beliefs about self, others in the future, uh, and coping strategies uh, as examples. Uh, next slide, please. Moving on to case formulation. So I often think about the seven Ps uh, when I'm formulating. Presenting problem we've already talked about, predisposing factors we've talked about, and then uh, get a sense of precipitating factors. So we can break that into distal precipitants, those factors uh, where there was a significant change in the rate or frequency or intensity of, of, of the agoraphobia, what was happening around that time uh, for the client, but also on a daily basis, more proximal triggers, uh, what's, what's triggering uh, the avoidance or the anxiety uh, uh, every day for the, for the client. And then the perpetuating factors, what keeps it going? Well, the cognitive content, the thoughts and the images that the client maybe uh, ha has going through their mind about uh, uh, what may occur if they don't avoid um, these situations helps us to establish a differential diagnosis about what might be driving that avoidance. Uh, as a clinician, we're, we're aware that attentional biases, interpretation biases, and memory biases may all be at play in the session as well. So the client is focusing their attention on the perception of threat. They might be interpreting fairly ambiguous information in their environment consistently with their, their expectations of threat. And therefore they're more likely to remember those examples of, of, uh, of negative experiences at the expense of more benign or positive experiences. Um, in terms of avoidance, uh, we obviously wanna know a lot about the, the sort of situations they're avoiding the ways they're avoiding it, subtle and not so subtle ways, and how, how much more generalised that's becoming over time. Obviously, there are emotions we want to assess and also physiological symptoms of anxiety. Uh, protective factors, as I mentioned before, we want to recruit these uh, during uh, our, our therapy and, and use those to really support the client's recovery. Think about potential obstacles to change from their past experience of therapy, perhaps, or uh, whatever's happening in their life that might interfere with their progress. Uh, and, we, and we need to plan for contingencies around those. And then obviously that all this leads to the treatment plan itself. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a formulation, a simple formulation we may uh, bring together uh, for uh, Stella uh, based on Clark's cognitive model of, of panic disorder. And I've uh, adapted it here to take into consideration some of the features of agoraphobia. So we might have a trigger stimulus, an internal stimulus of maybe physical sensations of anxiety or external uh, situations. In Stella's case, crowded, noisy places, social situations, shops, university campuses, and she describes buses as hell on wheels. So a bus is definitely a, a trigger stimulus. There's some sort of perception of threat in these, these contexts, which leads to that apprehension and the fight or flight response. So there'll be a lot of psychoeducation around what the fight or flight response is and what, how that manifests for Stella in terms of bodily sensations, how that leads to some sort of catastrophic interpretation of the sensations, but also the situations. Um, she talked about being dragged away for torture uh, by her friends and, and, and sister, I think, in, in the case, and they're feeling trapped like a rat in a box with no escape. And I'd want to know well, if she were continued to be uh, trapped, uh, what then would happen? What are, what are her predictions about that? So to prevent those cat catastrophes happening, she engages in a lot of avoidance, of uh, uh, using emergency exits, escaping, avoiding, using more time at home, spending more time at home. And all the, this really serves to maintain the perception of threat and keep the cycle going. So really we want Stella to understand these cycles, see how it explains her past experience, her current experience, and how it also presents hope for change uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an altered future that's more, more positive. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the core components of treatment, a lot of psychoeducation during that individualized case formulation, we might engage in some cognitive restructuring and, and thought challenging to modify that perception of threat. And a lot of that challenging might happen through behavioral experiments where we're setting up 
um, experiments where we're directly testing some of her fears, uh, and that might involve interoceptive exposure to the physical sensations, situation, uh, situational exposure and in vivo exposure. And that, that while she's doing that, really abstaining from any subtle avoidance behaviours, because those behaviours are going to stop her from really directly challenging her fears. We may introduce some de-arousal strategies. Um, I don't often use those routinely because they can stop um, Stella from learning that her anxiety is not dangerous, it's not threatening, it's not going to lead to a catastrophe. Uh, so it really depends on the function of, of the de-arousal strategies. Is it just to dampen down some of the feelings or is it to try and prevent a catastrophe? If it's the latter, we really want to not use them when we're doing the behavioural experiments. And then routinely outcome uh, monitoring her outcomes session by session to make sure our treatment's having an impact. That's oh, great. Thank you to Steve now. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Wonderful. Um, so just before we move on to Lisa Lampe, I just want to uh, remind people to post questions if you have them. There are no questions as yet, which is unprecedented. I've just checked. The system is working. So just remember, you've got to put your mouse cursor down to the bottom of the image and hover over the three dots there. And then that'll show ask a question. You click on that and ask a question. Uh, so we should be able to answer those when we um, get to that point in the presentations or in the webinar. So now, Lisa, thank you very much. Let's hear the psychiatrist's perspective. Thank you. Um, I guess generally by the time a patient comes to see a psychiatrist, um, often they're not making the sort of progress that the referring practitioner would have hoped for them to make. So I guess the first thing that we tend to think about is, is, is the diagnosis right? Um, so in this case, I would take a close look at the history and, you know, there's a few little pointers that maybe we should consider some other things. There's a reference to being shy. So could this be social anxiety disorder and could that be the primary disorder or could it um, be a coexisting disorder? Noting that endorsing shyness is really pretty common. Um, and particularly in that age group, it wouldn't at all be unusual that entering a new social environment like university could cause a transient increase in shyness and social anxiety. Shyness is also particularly common in younger people. And um, so, you know, it's not abnormal. But I would just be thinking in the back of my mind, OK, could this be social phobia? Um, her key concerns appear to be physical symptoms, so that certainly makes panic and agoraphobia more likely because social phobia is much more about worrying what people are going to think about me, and there's a little bit of that, but it does look as though the physical symptoms are more likely. And, of course, I would be wanting to think, could a medical condition or treatment explain these symptoms? There's a little hint about alcohol use, so I'd certainly be wanting to explore that further and just checking what level and are any other substances involved. Uh, next slide. So there's a few things to keep in mind diagnostically. And first of all, um, panic attacks don't make it panic disorder. Panic attacks can actually be seen in any anxiety disorder. So that of itself is not enough for us to say, okay, this is a panic disorder. I really would want to clarify with Stella what her main fears are. So, for example, is the worst thing to her that somebody might think that she's bullish or looks odd or otherwise negatively evaluates her? Or is she much more worried about some terrible physical or mental outcome, like uh, Peter highlighted in his slide about losing it or being trapped and what would happen if she was trapped? What does she fear would happen? Um, the associated avoidance certainly makes it phobic. So that means that um, if she's having the panic attacks, it would be, and, and the main fear is physical or um, uh, perhaps um going insane, then a panic disorder and the associated avoidance um, would make it agoraphobia if she's avoiding because of those fears. And just noting that age is a very relevant factor when we're making a diagnosis because anxiety disorders usually present for the first time in the teens or 20s. It is highly unusual for a patient over 40 years to be presenting with um, anxiety for the first time, particularly 
um, panic or a phobia. So that's a bit of a red flag. And the two most common things to think about in that case would be, is it really a depression with prominent anxiety symptoms? Or is there in fact some um, organic cause, a medical condition or um, treatment? Uh, next. Uh, we also would think about comorbidity as, uh, again, as Pete referred to, if you've got one anxiety disorder, you're likely to have more. Um, we always should think about major depression because there are some common genetic vulnerabilities between anxiety and depression, more particularly for generalised anxiety disorder. Um, but depression does come first in about 33% of cases. Um, in panic and agoraphobia, not so much in social anxiety disorder, which tends to come first. Um, a number of medical conditions, which um, our GP colleagues are very good at, at checking for, so um, I don't necessarily go into a lot of detail there, but just sort of tick the boxes. Um, and then we just need to check, could it be side effects of medication, um, possibly for some other medical condition or even psychotropic medication? Um, next slide. Um, we know some interesting things about the first panic attack. So DSM-3 or uh, DSM-5 oh, now, sorry, always talks about coming out of the blue. And the first attack may seem to come out of the blue. And it seems to most often happen when somebody is away from home, when they are intoxicated or withdrawing from substances, or when they've recently had an illness or are going through a period of increased stress. But thereafter, it's pretty rare that they come out of the blue. And one of the things that um, I or a clinical psychologist treating the patient will do is really help them learn what those triggers or cues are. Next slide. It's also interesting to think about when panic attacks occur. So um, there's often a, a misapprehension in in um amongst lay people that agoraphobia is the fear of the marketplace or the fear of open spaces, but really it's the fear of being anywhere where you wouldn't be able to escape or get help if you needed it. So people can get panic attacks when they're alone. They can get them when they're with friends and family. Uh, they can get them in their sleep. And that tends to be particularly frightening for people, but the good news is it responds just as well to our usual treatments. So panic attacks can actually occur really in, in a range of situations, um, not just when people are away from home. Um, next slide. Now, the treatment algorithm, this was from the um, RANZ, or it should say CP, Clinical Practice Guidelines. Um, that's the College of Psychiatrists. And these came out in 2018. Um, these steps really are often done by the, the GP. Um, so the GP makes a good global assessment. And then because so many conditions in general practice, and Carolyn can tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, but they often spontaneously resolve. So the GP takes a watchful waiting approach, but gets the patient to come back if symptoms haven't settled. And then we think about initial treatment based on severity. Next slide. And this is what we recommended in the guidelines, that for mild anxiety, cognitive behaviour therapy is the treatment of choice and medication is often not required at all. For moderate um, CBT or medication or both, but really we wouldn't recommend both. We think that um, one or the other is probably sufficient. And even in moderate cases, CBT, if the patient can engage with it and get good quality CBT is often sufficient. But when we start talking about severe anxiety disorders, then we are probably thinking about combining cognitive behaviour therapy and medication. And just noting that if a patient is likely to need medication for more than a few days, then it should be an antidepressant, not a benzodiazepine and not a beta, beta blocker. And the other key point to uh, keep in mind and for patients to know is it takes a lot longer for anxiety than it does for depression to see a response. So at least four to six weeks. Okay. I think that's it, isn't it? Have I got it is indeed. Thank you so <laughs> much, Lisa. That's fabulous. And um, the questions have gone bereft, which is great. There's been lots coming in now, so we've got plenty to talk about. Uh, and uh, we'll move into that phase of the uh, webinar now. Um, the first question, as I promised, because uh, she was the first cab off the rank, uh, 
uh, was from Lynette Moody, Moodley. And Lynette has asked, um, at what point will it be useful to explore the causes of the anxiety or panic in addition to symptom management? So when do we go back to look at what's actually maybe underlying this uh, rather than just treating symptoms? Lisa, it looks like you're up and it's hard for Lisa because she's using a Commodore 64 she found in the drawer. <laughs> hard to unmute. There she goes. Look, I just want to, um, I think, emphasise what Pete said is that um, genetic factors are much stronger in anxiety than they are in many other disorders and it's actually uncommon that there will be some cause like a traumatic incident or parenting experiences so um I often say to my patients, you know, you, you, you didn't cause your, your child's anxiety except insofar as they um, you passed on your genes. And so it's not something about parenting very often or a traumatic event. Um, and I think that that's probably good news for parents, but what, where they need to help if they've got anxiety, which one or other parent or both usually do, is show how to feel the fear and, and do it anyway. And I guess... Pete might want to add something there as well. I, think, no, I would agree with um, with everything Lisa said. Uh, I, I, mean, I guess we've talked about a bunch of potential causes of, of heraglophobia, um, and that's you know what, what we'd spend some time really trying to understand the content of the perceived threat um, that, that, that she's reporting. Is it, uh, and, and when it started, around the onset, what was happening for her, to really understand her interpretation of those contexts. And that will tell us a lot about um, how to treat it, how to respond to it, um, using the principles that we've been talking about. Um, you know, if there is a, a history of trauma, uh, you know, clients who grow up in very violent households, for example, uh, then, then it may be that we, we target that as well in treatment um, separately, uh, but we it won't necessarily mean we wouldn't also type the agoraphobia using the approaches we've been talk, talking about. But really that, that falls out of the assessment, the case formulation, and that will guide the intervention uh, rather than the other way around. And certainly diagnosis is one bit of information, but it's by far not the most important. Uh, everything else in the case formulation is, is far more important. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Now, the next question we've got from Andy Williams, who's been active in the chat box and has posted her question in the um, uh, in the uh, question area. Uh, and it's actually a really important one. It's saying that we don't have anyone with lived experience on the panel, primarily. Um, and I was just wondering if there is anybody on the panel who could maybe give us some insight into how things might resolve for Stella. Um, so what would she say about her experience if she or another person with lived experience was on the panel? Uh, I might ask you, Caroline, because you're sort of in the, the front line of general practice. The next time you see Stella for something else, what do you think she'd be saying about her experience? Well, I think it's a lovely segue from what Pete and Lisa were talking about before, about, you know, which comes first, the trauma or the, you know, like the, the genes, the trauma, everything else. What I love about working in general practice with people over time is I notice that their explanatory models about what's happening changes with time. And one of the richest things in general practice is because you see people little pieces as they're going through their, their therapeutic journey is you can just encourage them to reflect on that and talk about it. And so sometimes people really want to focus a lot on the bad things that have happened to them and and then your role is to kind of get them you know make sure they feel heard that they that they've really somebody's really listened because i think that in itself is immensely therapeutic and then maybe over time particularly with a condition like agoraphobia of saying well it's all it, part of the journey is to say well i understand that these things happen to me and i understand the link between them and this condition that i have or, or my family history or whatever but then there's a kind of a leap they have to make of saying, well, I now have to do some things kind of separate from that. You know, I can't just be a victim of my past or my my genes or whatever else. I have to now do this. And that that lived experience, that's the bit I find most interesting because I think it's really hard for some people. It's very unpleasant to do exposure. It's very challenging. And, and when, when the psychologists say to us, well, no, don't give them beta blockers. And I think we all accept, you know, not to give benzodiazepines, but it's very tempting to say, well, here's a little bit of, you know, beta blocker just to help you when you've got to do this. And so... The experience of the person is often this one of 
knowing that they're being helped, but often feeling like they're being abandoned because people are asking them to do things that make them feel worse. And I think that's that's a really important thing in general practice to have those conversations of saying, I know that that's part of the journey, um, but it's worth investing the time because you know I can tell them lots of stories of people I know who have gone through that journey and gotten better. But Pete might want to add to that. Pete? Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Um, firstly, uh, I guess I'd say that I, there's no way I'd ever ask anyone to do something that they didn't believe would be helpful for them. Uh, and so the process from the very beginning needs to feel very collaborative. And although we bring our expertise in terms of our understanding of theory and research and past clinical practice, the client is the expert in their life and their experience. And it's a coming together of those expertise that are going to produce the best outcome. So if ever a client of mine felt like I was asking them to do something that was terribly uncomfortable, for fun, or they didn't clearly see how it could help them, then I've not done my job well at all. So uh, the client needs to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, how, how it's going to be helpful to them, why it's important. And if they can't articulate that themselves and understand why it's important for them to do it, then, then we need to take a step back. Uh, and in terms of um, the, the individual uh, lived experience of, of recovery that is very individual and that needs to be us as, as clinicians really understanding where the client wants to get to and and helping facilitate them get to get there it's not our agenda it's not um so some clients it's going to be i just these panic attacks are you know uh, are just really affecting my life and i really want to be able to do x y and z so okay so there are priorities x y and z let's work together to get there. Now, the, a lot of the strategies we'll be working on in treatment are a means to an end. They may not be the ends themselves. It might be other aspects of the person's quality of life that really they want they're coming to therapy for, but they need to understand how those means are going to get them there. And if they don't, we've not done our job well. Okay. Can, can I well, add something, Steve? I'm you sorry. Go, Lisa, please. Um, in my experience, anxiety can be quite contagious from a therapist. And... I think sometimes um, treating clinicians offer medication partly because of their own anxiety. Um, you know, Pete's absolutely right. Um, I want I want my patients to be their own therapist, to understand why we would be asking them to do anything difficult and really negotiating it with them. But a lot of therapists get anxious about a patient's anxiety and sometimes prescribing. I think it's a little bit more to treat the therapist's anxiety than the patient's. Okay, we'll leave that one sitting there because it's a really important point and uh, obviously uh, something we need to be very mindful of. Um, but it has actually, a couple of you have now mentioned exposure therapy and that was something that came up in the um, questions that were submitted before the webinar and it's coming up a bit in the chat box as well. I'm just wondering, Pete, did you have any thoughts, any more thoughts about exposure therapy and its role in agoraphobia? Sure. Look, it's, it's, it's where we get the biggest bang for our buck in, in therapy. Um, and, you know, traditionally we might have used a mainly behavioural rationale, so it's about habituation and just repeatedly going back into the situation, desensitising. But really, in contemporary practice, it's more a cognitive formulation. It's about uh, what is your prediction specifically about, it might be about your anxiety, how intense it's going to get, how long it's going to stay up for. It might be about the, how other people respond to you in that situation. We really need to isolate very specifically the client's predictions in that situation and set up the circumstances where they can directly test those beliefs and find out once and for all how accurate they are. And we know we've done our job well when a client's walking back to the clinic, if we've gone out of the clinic to do an exposure, shaking their head in disbelief. They're just so surprised that their fear did not come true. That's when we know where we've really maximised what we call the expectancy violation, that difference between what they were predicting and what actually happened. And that's where the most powerful learning occurs. So before I mentioned I rarely use controlled breathing or uh, relaxation in conjunction with exposure, I, I really would never do it. The reason is because it minimises that expectancy violation. There's always another explanation for why the client survived or why they could cope. It's only because I did uh, the, the controlled breathing. But in fact, 
if we as therapists believe that anxiety is not dangerous, it's not harmful, and it's tolerable, and actually I go into uh, therapy knowing that my clients are far more capable than they believe themselves to be, then really what I need to do is create the circumstances for them to learn that about themselves uh, and maximise that expectancy violation. So we don't need to control it. We don't need to minimise it. We can just actually go and experience and ride the wave, come out the other side and learn something about how intense it gets, how quickly it passes and how the client is capable of tolerating it. Some of my biggest wins actually have been when clients have occasionally had panic attacks while we've done exposure exercises. And they might have the belief, now I've got to go home and rest for the rest of the day. And we test that belief. I remember a client who, who wanted to do that and would typically do that, but she decided instead to go into uni and test that out. Came back to me next week and said, I could not believe how productive I was that afternoon. I thought I'd be shattered and couldn't achieve anything. And that was a huge turning point for her. The violation of her expectancy was so massive that that um, she was just uh, ran away with it and, and was doing amazing things. So uh, there's a, a well-designed behavioural experiment. We can always learn something about the probability of the fear coming true, the cost of it if it were to come true, and also the client's capability to cope if it comes true. So our job is to help the client learn those things about themselves. That's great, Peter. And um, to... Uh, lift a quote out of the chat box from Daniel Make, the amygdala learns through experience, uh, which probably sums up a lot of neuroscience in a few words. It's great. So thanks very much. And lots of positive responses too for Lisa's comment on dealing with the counter-transference uh, that we have to be very, very mindful of. So plenty to talk about still. And I'm actually going to go back to Lisa now because there's been a number of questions that have popped up in the chat and also more formally asking about um, comorbidities and overlap presentations, um, everything from autistic spectrum disorder, alcohol addiction, um, PTSD, depression, all of those sorts of things. And just wondering about how much we, I know we've already touched on it, but how much do we have to tease apart those comorbidities or do we rank order them in treatment or do we try and take a more of an omnibus approach? Um. Comorbidities are extremely important um, because they're very common and I think um, it's important to be aware of them. Having said that, sometimes patients don't disclose all the detail until they trust us better um, or sometimes they've so much accommodated or learned to live with symptoms that it doesn't occur to them to, to mention them. So sometimes it's something that we find out over time as we get to know the patient better. But it is really important to be aware of um, other other symptom clusters, if you like, that could be there. I'm a little bit cautious about thinking that we have to give a name to them all and diagnose them, um, because in or, in order to help an individual, we need that individual's problem list. So although I do a diagnostic exercise, and I sometimes just have to be aware that there are some symptoms suggestive of PTSD or ASD or whatever it might be without um, meeting a full hand. And also I'm careful about putting a label that might stick and, and not be particularly helpful. So I'm cautious about making a lot of those diagnoses. But in terms of enumerating the problems that they're causing, difficulty sleeping, social anxiety, um, drinking too much or relying on substances, I think that's the way that we can then start to prioritise what an individual's problems are and what ones are causing the most distress and impairment and then think about strategies that we can use. So that's where the formulation, individualised formulation, becomes very important. And then as we go along, okay, if it becomes clear that they meet criteria for another diagnosis, then we might share that, that with them because it can be helpful sometimes. I mean, labels aren't all bad. Sometimes they help you um, look for more information or get in touch with, with support groups, for example, um, or for us as therapists to think about other treatments that might be helpful. I will say it is important to think about a trauma history because um, 
as has been mentioned, exposure can be very confronting. So we do need to be mindful of the sorts of things that might be, be triggering for people. Um, but that is all part of a, a comprehensive assessment. And as I say, I think gradually putting the pieces together over time. Well, in the question, Sasha's actually given us a particular symptom that ties in nicely to Stella going off on her sister's hen's night, which is that, um, again, on differentials, that thoughts on your thoughts on avoidance of public places being driven primarily by fear of vomiting induced by anxiety and escape not being possible. Um, and the consequence, the feared consequence is judgment of others and embarrassment of being seen vomiting rather than the act of vomiting itself. Throwing it at the three of you here, what would be your first approach if Stella had um, uh, come with that particular symptom? What what would you focus on? Peter, you're like you're nodding or vertically shaking your head. I'm not sure which cultural sign you're giving me. Uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy to speak to this. Um, so the, 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 the primary um, perceived threat is what's going to probably guide our, our diagnostic assessment. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we uh, an important change, I guess, in DSM-5 was that um, agoraphobia didn't have to be, um, um, panic disorder didn't have to be present to be able to diagnose agoraphobia. So that's a really important um, thing to keep in mind. ICD-10 already allowed them to be diagnosed separately. So the agoraphobia that Lisa defined earlier um, is really agnostic to what the fear actually is, but it, other than people being afraid of help not being available should they need it. Uh, so why do they need help? Uh, that may differ uh, across people. Is it a fear of falling? Is it uh, a fear of panic attack? Is it a fear of, of something else? Um, so that, I guess, is the first point. Um, the second point, in that example, uh, we could be thinking is it in, for differential diagnosis, emetophobia, that fear of vomiting, uh, but there's a social um, aspect to it in the, the fear of judgment from others, uh, if I were to vomit. Um, I guess for differential for that, I'll be saying, well, is the social anxiety generalised beyond just the fear of vomiting? Is the person more broadly fearful of other people judging them negatively for other reasons as well, that they, their symptoms of anxiety might be obvious to them, that they might fall short of other people's expectations in some important way, um, or you know, some sort of rejection may, may ensue because of the way they're behaving. So if that's more generalised, then I'd be thinking more social anxiety is part of the picture and maybe the vomiting is, is, a, is a consequence of that and then the social judgment. Um, but if there's no generalisation of that fear of negative evaluation, then I might be thinking more emetophobia as a specific phobia uh, and maybe with, with agoraphobia as a fear of going out in case help isn't available should the person feel unwell and, and vomit. But it could be that the avoidance is really driven again by the emetophobia uh, itself. Um, so again, your case formulation should um, address that. The other point I'd make following on from Lisa's point and the question about co-occurring problems, we can take a very transdiagnostic uh, perspective as well, because um, you know, a little secret is that you know, all anxiety disorders are going to involve some perceived threat, some negative thought, leading to some emotion of fear and anxiety, which leads to some sort of emotion-driven behaviour, which is some sort of avoidant behaviour, which then maintains the perceived threat. And that's the cycle. We could plug into that simple formulation, really any anxiety disorder. So what do we want to achieve? Well, we want clients to learn how to manage their thoughts more effectively so that they're more balanced and more uh, uh, accurate and, and more helpful to them. We want them to learn that they can cope with those emotions without having to avoid them. So the emotions themselves aren't as scary as they used to be. Um, and we want them to directly challenge their perceived threats as well by actively confronting those situations and learning that it's less probable, their fears to come true, less costly, or they can cope better than they thought. So if we take those general principles, we can apply that to any of those anxiety disorders. So uh, in, in this example, I'd say, well, avoiding a social situation for fear of negative evaluation is serving the same function as avoiding a situation for fear of vomiting. It's, they're both avoidant functions. So if the client can really understand the function of their behaviour, they're doing the avoidance for good reasons, because they want to protect themselves from threat. That's the, 
really important point to validate that. They're doing it because it has helped in the past and they believe it's helping them currently. If we can help them to understand how those behaviours are actually in the longer term maintaining the problem, so it's worthwhile experimenting with dropping them and learning that actually they can cope better, it's less probable and less catastrophic than they thought. And that can be applied to fear of vomiting, fear of negative evaluation or any other fear then they are learning how to generalize those principles across their problems. And it's going to be a much more efficient and effective way of treating their primary problem, but also their co-occurring problems and hopefully leave them less vulnerable to relapse down the track. Great. Thank you very much. And um, actually, I'm going to jump in and ask a question that anybody can respond to because it's got quite a lot of support in the chat box, which is about... Um, whether there could be sensory sensitivities going on in Stella's case here and the sorts of things that she's avoiding. Carolyn, I can see you nodding. I mean, presuming she's not vomiting and you're not taking a um, more physical approach, would you be wondering about autistic spectrum disorder if she was complaining of sensitivities like that? Yes. I mean, I, I, this is something I, I certainly think in the last few years it's become easier to have conversations about because our patients are also much more informed about this and whether the pandemic helped people spend enough time on the internet to start asking these questions which I think is a great thing that they're actually questioning it and I, I have had a few patients who have had sort of physical fears that we thought were anxiety and then they've raised the question themselves is this a sensory problem and I guess the challenge for me as a GP is then often the psychologist they're seeing who's trained in pure CBT says well I don't this isn't really in my area of expertise go back to the GP and find someone else and that can be really hard as a GP because you go well you know, it is a slightly different thing than just sort of textbook CBT and how am I going to help the person? And I do think if psychologists have expertise in this area, it would be really good if they, you know, highlight it on their website so that we know there are people who are comfortable dealing with those variations because it can be quite challenging for a patient when a therapist says, well, you've had your dose of CBT and I think you've got something else going on and I can't help. And, you know, there's a shortage of professionals to help in that area. So any sort of advice around who's comfortable offering that so that people don't end up just going around and around the sort of therapy circles and starting again, I think it's really important. And then from the GP point of view, it's about being really compassionate and saying, you know, yes, these, this is possible. Um, but for most of us in general practice, even that those of us who are comfortable delivering simple CBT, we probably would want some extra help around, you know, those for all the things Lisa said about not, you know, using labels inappropriately and, and confusing people more. Yeah. I must say, I never wrote the case thinking of Stella as being neurodivergent, but it's something that would be in your mind, all of you, I guess, when you think meeting somebody with Stella's issues. All right. So thanks so much for everything that's been said so far. There has been quite a lot of, well, quite a few questions asked about other approaches to therapy. And as uh, as Carolyn said, you know, some people might not see um, CBT is always the front line of treatment here, but Question from Kay about the um, the the role of other counsellors in particular, like school counsellors or counsellors that Stella might have access to uh, educationally at the university. Um, just wondering about how uh, perhaps counsellors who are not particularly health professionals might be able to assist Stella with her problem. Well, I mean, I guess I could respond there because as a GP, we often hear that people are going to see different types of help and so that kind of conducting the orchestra of saying well let's not make let's make sure that different types of help don't confuse each other um you know like if someone's having a dose of cbt then you kind of want them to stick on that path until we've decided whether it's going to help or not um but i think so this is where school counselors can often be really helpful in being that sort of empathic con connection contact but just being really mindful of not undermining therapeutic approaches and certainly not saying, oh, why are you trying that? It doesn't work because that's not really helpful once someone started something. And um, so I'm really grateful if people, my experience as a GP, people will often turn up and say, the counsellor said I should just come and see you and get this. It's very rare for them to call or leave a message. And I'm very grateful when people do. I know it can be hard to get hold of GPs and we can find it hard to get hold of school counsellors. But having a quick chat about, you know, our alignment, I think can really help just so that everyone's on the same page. And I think a school counsellor can be hugely helpful, particularly when the family's not so engaged or they're a bit sceptical about the benefits or there's cultural issues that the, you know, a traditional clinical psychologist might not have grasped so much in individual therapy. And I think that they do play a role there, but I think it has to be a team game. 
not individuals giving, um, you know, unsolicited advice. I'm actually, thanks, Caroline, I'm actually going to go back because there's a question I've got, and uh, fortunately it's also been asked by Lisa, oh, no, sorry, by Jess, which is about, um, in Lisa's presentation, why is a presentation over 40 years of age a red flag? What in particular? And somebody else asked about menopause, obviously a bit later than 40, but um, we're just curious about why in particular over 40 is a red flag. Oh, well, it's actuarial. Um, for example, 90% of people who are going to get um, social anxiety disorder will have it by 30. Um, so it's it's just saying, um, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, at least in Australia, um, knowing that a particular condition is much more common in a particular age group, that's all. So it doesn't mean you can't get anxiety for the first time over 40, but it's uncommon. So it means that I don't want to miss something. So I guess it's like chest pain, isn't it? If you're over 40 and you're getting chest pain, we're going to look a lot more carefully for a cardiac cause than in a 20-year-old presenting with chest pain. I mean, we're not going to absolutely exclude a cardiac cause, but we're going to perhaps really be thinking of a much broader constellation of possibilities. So that's all. It's just about the a what we know from large-scale population surveys about um, the ages at which people first get their anxiety. All right. Well, that's, that's useful. Uh, alters our diagnostic suspicion, I guess, depending on the person who's in front of us at the time. Now, we've only got time for a couple more questions, and there have been a lot after a slow start, which is fantastic. Um, but this one from Lisa, uh, it is Lisa this time. I hope it's not you asking this question, Lisa, because it is. If I see a client being prescribed benzos or beta blockers, how can I respectfully, respectfully suggest to the GP that antidepressants are actually the record for a recommended medication. I wonder, uh, well, <laughs> let's let's see how you would like to be told, uh, Caroline. Yeah, so I guess there's, every GP is different. I think, you know, the, the majority of GPs who prescribe benzodiazepines and beta blockers are doing it because someone else has given it before and the patient said it's helpful, or like Lisa, they're anxious, they want to reduce distress and they're anxious to do something and do it quickly. Um, so I don't, I don't, I think that, you know, Maybe when I was a younger GP, there were a lot of benzos th being thrown around haphazardly. But in my experience, it's much more that, you know, they've seen a psychiatrist or been given something in ED when they're distressed and then there's this kind of expectation of continuing it. So you shouldn't assume because a GP is prescribing it that they also think it's a great choice. That's the first thing. And I think the best way is when you write back to the GP saying, oh, you know, we had a conversation, the patient and I, about the limitations of benzodiazepines and beta blockers when you're doing therapy. Um, but I know it can be really difficult. Would love to have a chat with you about your thoughts on this. Because um, I certainly, I know a lot of the times I've prescribed these drugs, it's because it's been continuing from someone else. And I have actually said to people, these are not a great idea. They are not going to cure your anxiety. They're just going to make the treatment take longer. But, you know, you, you've got to temper that also with people's need for immediate relief for all the, you know, the fact that they've had, you know, brief relief for some of these medications. So I, I think it's, it is a respectful, it, it is good to be respectful, but I think it's also good to not assume that GPs think it's a great idea to be using these drugs. And so having more of a collaborative conversation about how can we reduce that in the context of what we're trying to do in therapy would probably be more productive. I hope, I hope that helps because I think it is, can be intimidating, can't it? Yeah. Pete, are you going to say something about that? Yeah, uh, just to uh, reinforce to Caroline that really the conversation for me would be with the client and talking to them about how it fits into their formulation, um, how they're using it and, and what it's teaching them about their capacity to cope. Uh, Lisa said before that really we want to make ourselves redundant and help the client to develop their own coping self-efficacy. So I'd have a, a conversation with them about when you take your ben benzodiazepine, does it help you to feel more or less confident with your ability to cope with your anxiety? Uh, and if our, our goal here really is to, to help you develop that confidence uh, so that you can then manage uh, down the tracks if you don't have your benzos on you. Um, and you know a lot of clients really don't want to be taking medication for the rest of their life either. So you might tap into that, medic that um, motivation. Uh, then you put it in your formulation as, an, as a, a safety behaviour or an avoidant behaviour 
and help the client understand how in the short term it may be having some impact of obliterating the anxiety symptoms, but in the longer term, undermining their, their coping self-efficacy. So if we're working towards building that and at the same time they're carrying and taking their, their, their benzos, then really we're working at a diff, very different goals. And uh, really there probably isn't much point in us proceeding with this approach. So I guess just, again, handing it over to the client to make that decision. Is, is building your coping self-efficacy something that you think is, is important to you? Or is it kind of um, continuing to use the, the benzodiazepines whenever you feel some anxiety? And, and leave the, leave the um, question open for them to answer. And if they're answering it, that actually, you know, I've tried this for a long time, it's not working, uh, then that gives you the opening to really underline the potential benefits of making that change. And then I'd write that back into my letter to the GP that that's one of our therapeutic goals is to, if not stop using uh, immediately, at least um, start reducing as part of the exposure um, program. What do um, you think, Lisa? Yeah, I, I think that with both this and the previous question about role counsellors, I think something that hasn't quite been mentioned is the patient's right to know what the evidence says um, so that they can make an informed decision. So there's a range of treatments available they have varying levels of evidence as to their likelihood to affect long-term improvements in function. And, um, I mean, I assume when something's been prescribed that there's a reason why that particular combination might have been prescribed. So I am careful. When I was younger, I probably wasn't careful, but now I'm more experienced and I understand um, that, you know, prescribing decisions can be complex. But I do think that one of the important things is to share what the evidence tells us with the patient so that they then are in a better position to make an informed decision. And many, you know, some patients won't like CBT or they won't want an antidepressant or they, you know, various, they won't want medication uh, at all. Um, but at least they then can make an informed decision if they, they know what the evidence tells us. That's great. And I think that conversation is really important. I would suggest that maybe in the chat, Deborah Fox has summed it up by saying it's a team game. Clapping hands emoji. Well said, Dr. Caroline. A collaborative approach is great, which is really what everybody has said, that getting that collaboration, not only between health professionals, but with the person themselves, obviously, and finding out as a GP, <laughs> getting some support in stopping something that I might not be totally happy with is a really good thing. Um, so you feel like you're not alone in that therapeutic relationship. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our question time now, but this is the really important bit where we get each of our panellists to um, sum up, summarise, say a few final words uh, about their approach to people with agoraphobia. So we'll go through the same order, I think, and start with uh, Caroline. Thank you. Well, I'll start where I where I finish where I started, which is remember the value of a, a continuous relationship with a GP. So encouraging people to have that ongoing support if you're a, working in the community with a GP, making sure they understand the advice you've given because the GP can really help you reinforce it because they will be seeing the person over time and they can certainly also revisit it when there's relapses in the future. So I think that's the, the main thing, that collaboration and continuity. Right, thank you. 30 seconds. Um, now uh, we'll go to Pete, your your final thoughts. Look, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today and I, and I think uh, some of the take-homes to me are definitely about collaboration, definitely the client focus, uh, definitely the importance of, of a comprehensive assessment and case formulation to really drive your treatment plan um, and using the approaches that are, that are most effective and most, most efficient based on the evidence um, and helping to socialise the client to that, as Lisa was just saying, uh, so that they can make a really informed decision. And again, just uh, thanking my colleagues for all the amazing work they do. Uh, we're just one so, psychologist, one cog in the in the um, in the wheel, and uh, uh, all the work Caroline and her colleagues do uh, really paved the way for us. And and Lisa and psychiatrists are so critical uh, when um, we have complex cases to really provide that additional support. And and the multidisciplinary team, P workers. Uh, it can also be really important in, in a lot of contexts, uh, but also, again, really focusing on the consumer's priorities 
uh, and uh, our role is to facilitate them to achieve that. Great. Thank you. That's what MHPN is all about, the collaborative teamwork. So fabulous. Lisa, your final thoughts. Um, yeah, look, collaboration, communication, teamwork. And then I'm going to echo something that Carolyn said right at the beginning, which was not giving up, you know. That was would be one thing I would say with patients too, you know, I'm going to stick with you until we, you know, find a way through this thing. I think, um, and I think if, if treatment doesn't seem to progressing, I think a, a good therapist will try to work out why. Why is this patient not seem to be getting the benefit that we hoped and expected they would get? So all those things and, and sticking in there. All right. Well, everybody's been exceptionally concise, which means I have a couple of minutes and people are leaving from the chat group, if I can see. But one thing we didn't touch on, and it's one thing we agreed to talk about before we started the webinar, which is about the role of family. And that, you know, for better or worse, um, Stella does have two sisters who uh, are in her life. Just wondering, in a couple of minutes, what sort of words would you say to her family in supporting her um, in being treated with agoraphobia? What can they do to try and sustain the messaging in the home? Pete, looks like you're ready, or, or Lisa? Yeah, I'm happy to speak first. Um, at the point where Stella and I have worked through her and developed her individualised case formulation, so she really understands uh, what what's maintaining her problems and also what's most likely to be helpful for modifying those problems and breaking the vicious cycles. It would be great to have a session or two with her family with Stella's um, consent, and uh, I'll chat to Stella before about the sort of things that we want to cover in that session. But um, And then I'd be um, asking Stella to articulate what she needs from them uh, over time and how she wants them to respond when she's feeling anxious and when she's asking for reassurance or, or being very avoidant. So um, the critical thing is that Stella really understands the, what's maintaining it, how, what needs to change, and then she can ask for it in a way that the, the family can understand and then respond to it, maybe even put down a plan, actually write down that plan. When I feel like this or when I'm doing this, I would like you to do this to help support me. So everyone's on the same page. You've got that in writing. Uh, and that can change over time, absolutely. But then the family have clear guidance, a clear way of how to help the client. The client is also uh, asking for the sort of help that is unlikely to get their back up and get them feeling angry and upset because uh, that's not going to um, get anyone anywhere. So that, again, collaboration, because actually collaboration and bringing the family into the room so that you can have that conversation uh, with them. The family may need some of their own individual support um, because sometimes it's very difficult caring for someone, a loved one who's really going through a difficult time. So that may be another suggestion that we might make. Great. Thanks, Pete. And you've actually picked up on a comment from Susan Camel, which is about making the client their own therapist in recovery and the idea of equipping um, to Stella with the ability to use her family members to do things that help her just sounds so important. So I think that's a really good message and probably an excellent one for us to, to finish on. Um, number two daughter's done tacos tonight, so finishing early is a bonus. Um, but thank you all very much for what you've said. It's been absolutely fabulous tonight. You've been so generous with your thoughts, and I think the um, audience have really appreciated what you've had to say. We do just have a few things to say, so please don't leave before we talk about uh, these few things, which is about completing the exit survey, which is really important, getting the feedback we need from you. So there is a banner um, above uh, where we are at the moment, or scan the QR code that will pop up at the end of the webinar. The recording's available. Those of you who had trouble uh, connecting or hearing or with the screen frozen, freezing, uh, there is a per there will be a perfect recording online for you to watch um, uh, in a couple of days and even to share with some of your colleagues if you want to have something to discuss. The next webinar is coming up, a fabulous one tomorrow. Emerging, web, emerging Minds Navigating Cultural Differences, Culturally Responsive Practice Supporting Families. So that's tomorrow at 7.15, and that will hopefully touch on a few of the questions we had tonight that I couldn't get to about cross-cultural difficulties. And then Wednesday, the 10th of April, 
we have no, I can't overcome, overcoming school refusal again with some fruity case studies there. So, um, and also there is a new webinar. It's not on the slide you're looking at now, which is about, and again, it's important for tonight, uh, supporting the mental health of a neurodivergent person with co-occurring autism and ADHD. So that's Wednesday, the 26th of June, close to the winter solstice to look forward to there. Before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you to everyone for your participation this evening and have a good evening. Good night.